Today, topic, I want to hear what you guys think. As soon as I have my little spiel, I'm going to get to you guys. How lean should you stay all the time, year-round? It's a question I'm kind of struggling with right now myself, honestly. So, yeah, obviously, you know, the answer is going to be different for everyone. It's a personal preference thing. Some people like to get lean only for certain things, typically like the summer. You know, for most people, I think, live in places where it's it's not sunshine and good weather year round. It's only, you know, I'm here in Boston area. We, we only can wear a tank top maybe from maybe late May to geez, mid September now. It's still warm enough, but it's only a few months out of the year. So if you're lean in most places, you know, it's, it's not like you can show it off. But the question is, how lean should you stay year round if you're still trying to grow? Because if you're all done, if you have all the muscle mass you, you ever want, which I don't know too many people who can honestly say that, uh, some, I, I talked to some pros. There's a few pros I know who they say, yeah, I'm big enough. And these guys are monstrously enormous. I'm not as big as I ever want to get. I'd like to get, you know, I don't see myself getting much bigger than this. Obviously, I'll be 52 next week. Um, I've been training for 38 years, but... <clears throat> I do want to compete again next year, and I do have a couple goals, physique-wise, that I want to accomplish before I start my prep for that, start, you know, getting ready for that show. I want a little more shoulder width and roundness, a little more back width, definitely more arms. Um, these are just going to help my overall shape, you know, on stage, because that that's very important. You, you know, you want to have the best X-frame possible. You want to have wide shoulders and back. Narrow waist, flaring thighs. I don't have a really narrow waist anymore. Uh, I did many, many years ago. In my early 20s, mid 20s, um, back when I was natural, I still had a pretty narrow waist, but now it's not that natural, so I need to get wider. So this is uh, the question people have been arguing about for so long, years, decades and decades. You know, how much fatter, put that down, that's a chair. How much body fat do you really need to put on if you're gonna put on muscle? We know that you need to be in a caloric surplus to synthesize new lean muscle tissue, meaning you have to be eating more calories, taking in more calories than you're putting out, calories in versus calories out, if you're trying to gain muscle mass. So, <clears throat> you know, we talk about like a resting metabolic, your base BMR, your base, base metabolic rate. It's basically how many calories you need just to sit, keep your, maintain your body weight with no additional activity. So let's say it's 2,500 calories. Um, then you have to factor in the calories you're exerting, you know, training. Uh, if you're doing other things, if you have any kind of physical job, you take that into accountability. And so you want to be over that amount. So say it's, say you need 3,400 calories every day just to maintain your body weight exactly where it is, your body fat exactly where it is, um, based on your, your metabolic rate and your activity level. So now we need to ask how many more calories on top of that do we really need to grow muscle? Um, the late Mike Menser was, a, was very uh, adamant about this, that you didn't need a lot of extra calories. He thought you only needed something like 30 extra calories a day. And then you have people at the opposite end of the ex uh, spectrum, the extreme, that will tell you you need, you know, like a thousand calories over that every day. So if you need 3,500 calories to maintain your weight, They'll tell you you need a thousand extra, so 4,500 calories a day. I'm just these are just random numbers I'm making up to put on muscle mass. There's definitely a point where you'll be putting on muscle, but you'll also be putting on fat when you go over that line. If you cross over that line, so uh, so many so much of my life as a bodybuilder, like I said, I'm almost 52, and I spent my entire 20s and 30s most of the year I was trying to bulk. I was just trying to put weight on. So I was, I'm sure I was eating in excess of, at some points, probably two to 3,000 calories more than I needed every day. As you can imagine, I got pretty fat. So when I was natural, I got fat and it looked pretty bad. It looked pretty bad because I didn't have a lot of muscle mass. <laughs> and when I was assisted years later, it still looked pretty bad because now I had not only the body fat, but I had like extra water retention from certain things I would use when I was trying to bulk up, you know, like a lot of tests, a lot of D-ball, some Anadrol, things like that, it would really bloat me, DECA. So it was a bad look. And, you know, uh, 
only in the recent years did I stop getting so fat in the off season where I just decided I just I, I hated the way I looked, especially my face got so round, porky looking. I cringe looking at pictures and even videos from from back in the the days when I was bulked up like that. I wanted to look better year round. I wanted to feel better year round, but it's vanity. I wanted to look better year round. Right now, uh, I've been very very lean since since about May, and we're you know we're midway through September now, May June July. This is the longest I've stayed this lean in my life. Uh, it's not hard to do. Um, I don't eat a lot more than I need to eat. But then the question in my head is, well, if I want to make those improvements to my physique, am I eating enough? Do I need to be eating more? Because how would I know, unless I started getting fat, that I was taking in too many calories? But how would I know if I wasn't taking in enough calories? It, it, it's a quandary, it really is. And I don't think there's any one, you know, one blanket answer that's going to apply to everybody. But I don't think we need to get as fat as we think we do. Um, if a lot of you guys, if any of you guys follow Coach Greg Doucette, he's made a lot of videos talking about this because he stays lean year round and he doesn't believe you need to get, you need to put on much body fat to, to gain muscle mass. He's more along the Mike Menzer school. Um, he did a video one time where uh, a few months back, you know, because the argument, uh, he was critiquing a video that Fouad had on with his a panel of, it was Fouad, Ian Valliere, I think James Hollingshead was there, and not sure who the fourth person was, but they were all of the of the mindset that you need a lot of extra calories every day, a huge surplus of calories to grow, to be able to grow new muscle mass. And, you know, Greg was shaking his head, and he had a lot of valid points to back up why he doesn't feel that's necessary. And I tend to agree with him. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a question of how lean, how many calories extra do you really need? I don't know the answer to that. And I honestly, I enjoy being lean now and I could, I could maintain this. This is a, someone the other day said, you know, you seem to be living at six weeks out. And I'd say that's, that's fairly accurate. If I wanted to get totally, totally shredded stage ready, I could do it in eight weeks max. I bet I could do it in six, six might be pushing it. I might, I might lose a little bit of muscle if I tried to come down that fast. I'm 220 right now. If you if you follow me on uh, Instagram, it's Ron Harris Muscle. I'm pretty lean. I'm not stage lean at all. You know, people will blow smoke up your ass. Usually they just don't know any better. They'll say, bro, you're shredded. You could get on stage right now. No, no. I couldn't get on stage right now. I w I'm not that lean, but I could get that lean. Six to eight weeks. Eight would be more com comfortable. You know, in the past, I always did a 16-week prep or more. And I had to because I was carrying so much body fat in the off-season. You know, I would, I would typically be 230 to 240. I, that was my off-season weight for many, many years. At some points, I went over 240, but not, not too often. Uh, 247 was the highest I ever got. And God, I looked and felt like a bloated sack of crap at 247, let me tell you. How tall am I, you wonder? Used to be, I used to be a little over 5'8". Now I'm definitely a little under 5'8". Uh, yeah, ter good thing I'm married because I couldn't date, right? Everyone would tell me, to, if you're under 6'10", swipe... Which way you swipe if you don't like the person? Anyway, <laughs> sorry guys, Tinder bad Tinder. Tinder jokes are only good if you know what the hell you're talking about. So, yeah, I, I'm at that point now where I'm not going to be out at the beach. There's no more pool parties. I'll still be in the gym with tank top and shorts, you know. So it's not like I won't be able to see my physique or anything like that. And I got it's vanity. I know it's vanity, but you know, I got into this to look good, to look better. When I was a kid, you know, I was hoping extra muscle and, uh, you know, the six pack and all that stuff would would get me more attention from the women and a little more respect from the guys. So I, I, I do this out of vanity. There's there's no I make no uh, apologies for that. You know, why would I why would any of us spend so much time and effort and money on this bodybuilding thing, all this eating, all this training? It's a lot. Why would you do it if it wasn't at least in part due to vanity? Just wanting to look good, feel good. Um, so yeah, that that's where I'm at right now. I don't want to get much fatter than I am right now. I don't want to get carry much more body fat. And I don't know what my body fat percent is. Um, I could start to see I'm a little fatter. I put on a few pounds. You know, true story. <laughs> I put on a few pounds. Two twenty. I was I was around. 
213 to 215 for a, a good six weeks during the summer. And I was, at that point, definitely five, six weeks max, I could have been stage ready. Starting to see like little glute striations on the side, you know, nothing great, nothing serious. But I, that, that's how I knew I was getting close to where if I wanted to compete, if I want to get in that level of condition, it was within striking distance, I'd be able to do it. I'm not that lean right now, but I'm not that far. If I could get back to that in two more weeks, three more weeks, if I cleaned up the diet a little, I was, uh, I was using Clin for about three weeks there at the, at the leanest too, I'll be honest. Uh, not much. I wasn't going, I wasn't going over, uh, they had 40 microgram tab. The tabs came in 40 micrograms and I was doing two a day. So that's only 80, you know, in the past when I was competing, I think I used to go up to like 120 a day, but anyway, so that's, uh, that's where I'm at now, guys, I'm going to get to your questions and comments. Hopefully they're sort of relative relating to what we're talking about. Because sometimes you guys go off on some tangents, and I don't blame you. That's what I'm here for. So let's go to F5. Okay. And let's see if you guys have anything to say. If not, I'll just go bye byes So, okay. First comment is in Cyrillic, Russian. I am of Ukrainian ancestry, but I do not read Cyrillic. I'm so sorry. A lot of thumbs up. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, sir. Thanks. I think Mike was right. I put on muscle while cutting. If you're putting on muscle mass while you're getting leaner, it's usually a couple. There's only a couple scenarios where that's really possible. One is you're regaining muscle mass that you had in the past. So maybe you carried this muscle and for whatever reason, you stopped training, stopped training as heavy. Maybe you were injured. It is possible in a scenario like that, when you come back to training, you'll be getting leaner and bigger at the same time. Uh, another scenario is you're finally using steroids. You're trying steroids for the first time. It's very, very possible to add muscle and lose fat on steroids, especially if it's your early stages of steroid use when they're the most effective for you. Your steroids are like any other drug. You know how they say like the first, the first uh, time you use heroin or crack or whatever is the best time? and you'll be chasing that high for the rest of your life. Typically, your first steroid cycle is, is similar to that. You get the best results that first cycle. You just say, you know, you, even average people with average response, they kind of blow up because it's such a shock to your system and your receptors are so fresh. And I don't know all the science behind it, but I do know from myself and from watching others on their first cycle, that's like the magic cycle. That's typically when you see people putting on, I've seen people put on, 20 pounds of pure muscle in, the, in their first cycle, which, you know, 12, 10, 12, 15, 16 weeks, something like that. That's, you know, that's rare. Most people will put on 20 pounds and 10 of it's, 10 of it's muscle. The other 10 is fat and water. Jeez, uh, where the hell were we going? Chris Walker. Jeez, you look ridiculously good. Pretty sure a lot of people have no idea you're still in such amazing shape. Well, then they don't follow me on Instagram, at Ron Harris Muscle. Yeah, man, I need some more followers. I can't believe it. Uh, if I was a chick with a, a booty, I'd have like a million followers. Uh, you look great, old man. Thank you, Spaniard Prince. <laughs> I don't even mind being called old man anymore. That used to bother me. Because I was getting that even in my 40s from some people. But, you know, at the time they were like 10 years younger. Now they're like 40. So I'm like, not so young anymore, are you, kid? Uh, Michael Williams, do you prefer staying lean year-round or fluctuating? Now I definitely prefer staying lean. I definitely prefer it. I feel better at a lighter body weight just physically. You know, when I used to be 235 to 245 uh, in the off seasons past, it, it was not comfortable. I, you know, my belly was, I could never even keep my gut in. My face was real round and full. Cheeks were like drooping off, like almost a double chin. And, you know, I'd get tired walking up a flight of stairs. Uh, I'd bend over to tie my shoes and like, you know, see stars. Like my head was going to explode. I, I, I never want to be that heavy again, just because of the way it felt. And, you know, facially, oh, oh, it was a bad, it was a bad look for me. So now it's more sense, uh, because I am older. It's, you know, I'm already taking risks by using steroids at my age, as a lot of you like to point out to me, <laughs> you know, I appreciate your concern for those of you who are genuinely, genuinely concerned. I do appreciate that you seem to care about my uh, health and well-being and longevity. But um, it, being heavy would, would really just uh, exacerbate the risk factor for me. I'd be at risk for a lot more health issues if 
I didn't stay leaner and do cardio and eat clean. You know, I do eat clean. I eat fruits and vegetables every day, oatmeal. I have an apple every day, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Blueberries in my oatmeal, strawberries, um, green beans. I don't eat too many vegetables anymore. I used to eat them with every meal, but uh, it's they, they were really bloating up my gut, man. Anyway, uh, let's see. Arthur Carvalho, good, good Portuguese name. What is a maximal tolerable body fat percent an athlete could peak at the end of an off-season bulking period? It, it, different body fats look different on different people, but I, I don't think you need to get that fat. I really don't. I know now that I, I got much fatter than I needed to. It wasn't conducive to, my, to getting bigger muscles. You know, another thing that you have to think about when you're that heavy, it really impedes your ability to train certain things like you know, if you want to do like high rep sets of squats and leg presses, back training, things like deadlifts, barbell rows, you need to have some wind because you're going to be breathing heavy. And if you're really overweight, if you've packed on like, you know, let, let's use an example. For those of you who compete, you know what your lean body mass is. So if you're, say if you compete as a light heavyweight and you weigh in at 198 pounds for your shows, you know that's that's your lean weight. How much heavier do you go over, over that in the off season? Most guys who compete as light heavies, they don't go any heavier than 230, 240. You know, not a, a lot of them try, and that's as big as they're going to get. But why would you get up to, I have known guys who compete as light heavies, who go up to like 260 or 270. Not, not many have gotten that heavy, but I have known people who have done that. And I'm thinking, why would you possibly do that? I think in their minds, they, they were thinking that they were putting on a lot of muscle mass, but then they start dieting, and they, as the fat comes off, they realize that's what it was. It was fat. That, that, that happened to me so many times, especially when I was natural. Uh, all those years, I would bulk up 225, 230. It was, and I was, it was sloppy. Because you're gonna, I was natural. When you're, you know, a 230 fat and natural typically un, looks worse than, than assisted because you have more muscle mass when you're assisted. Anyway, every time I bulked up, I assumed when I dieted down, I'd put on at least a few pounds of muscle, right? And I did put on a little bit, but it was never what I thought. I'd be like, man. When I dieted down and, and, you know, saw what I looked like in the mirror, I'm like, huh. So I thought I was a lot bigger than I was. That was a lot of fat and water. That wasn't really muscle. So another, that, that's another good thing about staying lean. I'm not saying you need to stay shredded. You know, staying like contest condition, I don't think anybody should attempt that year round. Uh, unless you're one of those very, very rare people who just looks like that. There are people who stay that lean naturally. That's their metabolism. There's not many people like that. But, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get so heavy that you can't see any abs at all. If, if, you're, if your stomach is a big, smooth mass and you flex it and even in the best possible light in your gym or in your bedroom or wherever, you can't see any abs, you can't see any serratus, you can't see any muscle separation. You got way too fat. You should always be able to see a little bit of muscle separation, always. Always be able to see a little bit of abs, at least like a little bit of the top row. If, you, if you're that fat where you... You're just a big blanket of fat. You know, every time, every every bit of fat you put on is going to have to come off. You know, I went through this with the, I, I do a little bit of coaching, not much. I don't have time to do a lot. But uh, I'm dealing with a woman now who's dieting for a show, and she got too heavy in the off-season. She thought she had added a lot of muscle. She had added some muscle, but she put on a lot more body fat. And now, unfortunately, she's got to go very low carb. She's got to do a lot of cardio. We might even have to pick a later show. Uh, because I don't want to do anything extreme with her. I'm certainly not putting her on diuretics for 10 days. But I'm just saying, you know, any 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 fat you put on, you're eventually going to have to take off. So why put on so much that you're going to have to really struggle and be miserable? You know, my next contest prep, it's not going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be a cakewalk. But it's not going to be anywhere near as difficult as preps past where I had to drop 30, 40, 50 pounds sometimes. Because I got too fat, you know. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna allow myself to get that fat again. I just. I'm at that point, you know. Where, when I was younger, I don't know. Did it make more sense when I was younger to bulk up? I'll never know because I never tried it both ways. I never tried staying lean when I was younger, so I'll never really know the answer to that. If you guys have, let me know. Um, let's see. You look great, old man. Thank you, Arthur Cavallo. We already answered that. Paula Gonzalez, do you feel like you gain muscle as good as getting a little more body fat? Do I gain muscle as good as getting a little more body fat? Uh, no entiendo su pregunta. Uh, trata otra vez, por favor. 
don't understand the question. Try that again, please. Because, uh, oh, I think I know what you mean. Do you feel you gain muscle uh, when you're get easier when you're putting on a little body fat? Yeah, I think you, you probably will have to put on a little bit of body fat to gain muscle. But the key word there is a little. I don't think anybody needs to put on a lot of body fat to gain muscle. Um, Arthur Jones, he's uh, the late Arthur Jones. He was a cranky, stubborn genius. Uh, he invented the Nautilus machines, if you're familiar with that brand. He's basically the reason there are machines in every gym now. He came out with Nautilus, and they mass-produced that and marketed the shit out of it. And then everybody else started coming out with their own equipment lines. He wasn't the first person to make equipment, but he was the first huge equipment company. Anyway, he used to say, when he was talking about how much body fat a bodybuilder should gain, because some people, a lot of people, especially back then, bulking, this was in the, he said this in the 70s, uh, 60s or 70s, when bulking was, guys got really fat back then sometimes. Not the guys in pumping iron. <laughs> like Arnold stayed lean and he would just juice up and get bigger. But uh, he'd say, do you think a car is going to run any better with a trunk full of sand, like a, a thousand pounds of sand in its trunk? Of course not. So I think about it that way. Are you really going to perform that better? Are you going to gain? Are you going to be able to train hard when you're that fat? I, I you know, you're going to have to rest a lot between sets. You're going to be sucking wind the whole time. Leg day is going to be a nightmare for you. I know, man. I did it. I trained, you know, I built most of my leg mass <laughs> in those bulking years. Heavy, heavy squats, heavy hack squats, heavy leg presses. But I was, and I remember when I was fat, it was it was tough because I could, it was my I was limited sometimes by my my lungs by my, I just couldn't get any oxygen because I was so fat, and I wouldn't do any cardio in the off season for years and years and years. You know now I'm older, I'm thinking a lot more about health and longevity. So I do cardio. I mean at the gym I do cardio three to four times a week. I walk my dog. He's a pit mix and he's he's pulling. He goes fast. I walk him once or twice. He gets two walks a day. I usually do both walks. So that's like a half hour, 35 minutes in the early morning, and then another one in the late afternoon. So I'm doing a lot of cardio. Um, where the hell was I going with that? Uh, let's see what else we got. You look like you're north of 250. No, damn impressive. I'm 220. But I'm five, seven and a half. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I tipped the, tip the phone up so I look taller, but no. Uh, let's see. Freddie Erickson. Freddie, thank you for watching and commenting on all these videos. Appreciate that. Because these are supposed to be interactive, these Ask Ron things. Uh, natural should be 13, 11 to 16% year-round. Yeah, I, I agree with that. 11% is pretty lean. 11%, you should be able to see pretty clear abs. You know, people talk about getting down to 0% body fat. Nobody's ever been 0% body fat, okay? You'd be dead. <laughs> You'd be dead. I, I'm sure some people have gotten down to 2 or 3. Um, I remember one time... You know those Tanita scales, or Tanita's a brand, but I remember in 2002, on my Instagram, Run Harris Muscle, I, I put a lot of throwback pictures from when I had the blonde highlights in my hair, because that was that was a show, the 2002 New England. Oh, someone just gave us money? No shit. Um, anyway, two days before the show, some trainer at my gym at the time said, hey, why don't you try out this new scale I have? It tells you your body fat. I'm like, all right. So I went in there, Did this was after morning cardio. It was like 6 in the morning. I was going to go home, eat, and then come back uh, like an hour later and do my weight training. It's the beauty of working at home. Anyway, it's, <laughs> I had I had pretty good striations in my glutes at that point. I was only two days out, and that was a show I was in really good shape for. It read me at like 13.6% body fat, and it was set on athletic. So after that, I'm like, these scales are garbage. So I don't really like to go by percentages. I don't know how accurate any of these testing methods are. You know, maybe if you have like one of those bod pods or something in your house or you have access to one. Some of these things are pretty accurate, but I'd rather go visually. If I can see my abs at least a little bit and some separation, I know I'm not I'm not that out of shape. If everything's just one smooth mass, yeah, he, I, I went too far. Not really a bodybuilder. And you know, Arnold used to say, um, if you can't see your intercostals, which serratus, if you can't see that, you're not a bodybuilder. You know. You can be a fat boy, you can be a perma bulker, but you're not going to look like a bodybuilder. It's, you know, I know we don't, you're not supposed to say we do this for the attention, but come on guys, we do this at least partly for the attention. I know when I'm, when I was fat, people didn't, people didn't really even know I was a body. They just thought I was a fat guy <laughs> in clothes, especially a little fat guy. Uh, and I wasn't that fat, but you know, 
But once you get leaner, people people look at you more, they ask you a lot more questions because it's intriguing. They see all these muscles. You can see the muscles. When you're fat, you really can't see the muscles. You're just seeing one smooth, undifferentiated mass. Uh, it's kind of like a diamond in the rough versus when they cut the diamond, it's got all those little facets and sparkly things and all that shit. Uh, messages held for review. Uh, well, I'm going to say it anyway. Daniel, Daniel says, uh, my arms are my weak point, but they really look like shit when my body fat is very high. And if I go down with the weight, they start to show off. Why is that the case? It's just like I said, it's just like a, a an uncut rough diamond versus a cut diamond with all the facets and things showing. Same here, man, because my arms have never, the trolls love to point it out, but believe me, I'm well aware. I've been aware of this for longer than most of you trolls have been alive. My arms have never been a strong point. When I'm bulked up and fat, they look even worse. Biggest my arm ever measured, this one was 19. I swear to God, it was 19. Did it look like a 19-inch arm? No, it looked freaking fat. It was just a blob. Diet down, it's you know it's, it's 18 right now, but if I diet it down, I'd probably lose a little bit off of it. It'd be a little under 18 inches, but I guarantee you it would look much bigger than that 19-inch fat blob arm that I had years ago. It's because you can see the shape of the muscle come through. You can see the separation between the muscle groups. You know, in the bite, you can see the heads of the biceps, the heads of the triceps, cross in the triceps when you're super lean. When you're fat, you can't see any of that, and it, it's just not as impressive. It's, it's, it's and generally speaking, when you get leaner, you look bigger. If you see these before and after pictures, you can see a guy on one side where he's before, say he's 230 and he's white, pasty, you know, just looks like Pillsbury Doughboy. Just there's no definition, no cuts anywhere. On the right, maybe he's 195, and now he's tanned. All the cuts are in the separation. He looks twice the size. He's not twice the size. He's actually smaller. He's taking up less space on planet Earth, but it looks so much bigger and so much more impressive. And uh, I, I've I've convinced so many guys, so many perma bulkers that I've known. Usually, if they're like friends of mine or people I know at the gym. I've, I've talked them into, I say, you know what, try getting cut. You don't have to get shredded, but try dropping weight. I guarantee you, you're going to look bigger. And there's one guy at the gym now, uh, black dude, Mike, always been a big dude, but you know, just a big shapeless dude. He's dropped, he's down to like, he's down from like 265 to 232 or something. He looks so much bigger. He's not bigger, but he looks so much bigger. His waist came in. His abs are coming in. He's got some serratus. You can see a you know, separation in the delts, upper back, arms. He's looking so much better. So when you're leaner, you give the illusion of looking bigger, even though clearly you're not really bigger. All right, next one. Freddie Erickson again. Natty lean is what they call in South Beach is gay fat, a.k.a. juiced. Natty lean. Yeah. Ron doing masters to get pro card. Yeah, I want to do that next year because why not? I know so many, everyone I know, I've been, you know, obviously I've, I'm older. I've, I know a lot of people that compete and almost everyone I know who's my age is already a pro, um, men and women, they all turn pro. And a lot of these guys, these are guys I used to beat. These are guys that there are people turning pro in masters now. Not all of them. You, believe me, I wouldn't, I'm not saying I would beat all of them. No, 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 no. But there are some guys I see getting pro cards. I say, I could beat that guy. So why not? I mean, it's it's. Uh, I don't need a pro card. I'm not gonna try to be some great pro bodybuilder. I know what I look like. I know I would not stand a rat's rat's chance. a snowball's chance in hell because hell's very hot and snowballs are cold and they melt. I wouldn't stand a chance in in a two twelve or I wouldn't do open. I would have to do two twelve. But I still want that pro card. It's like a it's like a validation. It's like a college degree for all the hard work you put in. And you know when I see people that have they haven't been doing this that long. You know, I remember seeing like, uh, I know it's not the same, but I see women in bikini, women's physique. Sometimes they've been training like a year or two and they turn pro. And I'm like, sometimes I've been training a lot longer than these people have been alive and they're pros. So yeah, why not? Why not go for it? Uh, let's see. Like John Meadows. Yeah. John turned pro as a master's. Josh Wade did. And he's actually done pretty well in a lot of open shows. Um, yeah. Yeah. John won his card at the universe. 20 so i was the last year i did the universe masters was 2013 
Derek Upshaw won it in 2014. He won the Masters both 35? Was he 40 yet? No. Was he 40? I don't know. He turned pro the next year. He looked great. Then Meadows won the year after him at the Universe. He won the Masters overall. And then the year after him, Josh Wade won. So that's a good show, but I can't really do the Universe because it's in July and I'm still covering shows for MD. I'm still out, out of town on weekends and when I'm in that press press pit in the front row with the photographers and everything, I'm basically a photographer now, so all day and night for like two days, I'm I'm with my camera. I don't have. I can't sit there. And blah, blah, blah. All right, we're going to stop the contest coverage, everybody, because I got to eat my chicken and rice. No, I can't do that. I, this is a hobby. Bodybuilding is a hobby for me. I love it. It's my passion. Um, I love competing and everything, but it's not. I'm never going to make any money competing. I'm never going to make any money as a bodybuilder from my physique. So I have to prioritize the things that do make me money. My career, because I got my son still in college. I still got this mortgage. A couple more years. Uh, car payments, insurance, all that. You know, we all got bills to pay, man, right? Uh, let's see. Paula Gonzalez. Oh, so she says, like, being lean now, you don't gain much muscle. No, but I don't, you know, I'm, I'm probably a bad example because I am older and I've been training so long. I'm not going to put on much more muscle anyway. I'm very, very close to my 100% genetic limit for muscle mass. I'm sure of that at this point. If I really loaded up on a ton of drugs... Didn't care if I lived or died. I could probably put on a, you know, I don't know. I'm just taking a wild guess. Maybe 10 more pounds. But a lot of you people out there, a lot of you guys, girls, we do actually have some female viewers. That's crazy. Uh, a lot of you still have a lot more growing in front of you left before you're all before it's all said and done. Some of you probably have 20, 30 pounds still to gain or more before it's all said and done, especially if you haven't been doing this very long. Some of you might have 50, 60 pounds of muscle ahead of you. Uh, you know, just to put it in perspective, when I, I started weight training at the beginning of ninth grade, I was f just turning 14 years old, and I was four foot eleven and 95 pounds. I wasn't even a 98 pound weakling; I was a 95 pound weakling. So I went from 95 pounds when I started weight training. Granted, I was just starting puberty, so it's maybe not the best example. But 95, and my high point was a little over 245. So do the math; I, I put on a lot of weight. Um, so for, for you guys out there who still have all that growing left to do, I don't know, maybe maybe it is in your better interest to get a little fatter. But like I said, just a little bit. You don't. I, I don't believe anybody needs to get that much fatter to support muscle growth. There's a certain amount of calories that you'll need for the muscle growth. And then everything after that is going to be surplus extra. What does your body do with extra calories? It stores them because we are descended from these hunter-gatherers you know, uh, 100,000, a million years ago. We were descended from hunter-gatherers who did not have supermarkets. They didn't know how to grow food. They basically walked around the world looking for food, looking for things growing to eat and killing animals to eat. And sometimes there was no, sometimes there was a drought or whatever. There was no, there were no plants growing. Animals were dying. Sometimes there was just not a lot of food. And these people would go long stretches of time without eating. So the ones who were able to store more body fat they survived those famines and those times without food. And the people who had less body fat, they died. So we evolved to carry more body fat as a survival mechanism. That was I talking about? I don't even know. So that means I need to go to the next question. See, I, I get off track pretty easy, don't I? Uh, what's your opinion? Range of surplus when try to build muscle. Range of... Uh, I don't want to put a number on it because I'm, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not... I don't claim to be an expert in these matters, but I, and I don't think there's ever been any studies to determine how many extra calories do you really need to build muscle mass. Obviously, we know you have to cover your resting metabolic rate and your activity level, but on top of that, I can't imagine it's more than a couple couple hundred extra calories a day to put on new muscle mass. Maybe it's Maybe it's like 300 or 500. I don't know. It's certainly not in the thousands of calories. You know, you see a lot of these people in the off-season, they're fat. Trust me, I was a poster boy for fat off-season guy for years and years. I, I'm convinced. I'm certain I did not need to be that fat. I still could have gained muscle at the same rate. Maybe I would have gained muscle even better because, like I said, my leg training, my back training, I would have had more endurance, more wind. I don't know. Uh, you know, you see people like strongmen carrying 
uh, a lot more body fat. So it's arguable, but they're, they're about strength. That's pure raw power. It's very, very different from what we do as bodybuilders. Uh, Trip Paul, Trip Raul. How not to become watery and bulking? Yeah, but Freddie Erickson says, yeah, but now your back is fucked. Yeah. I mean, my back, yeah, I train as long. If you train for 30, 40 years, heavy, You'd be very, very lucky if your back was still fine and dandy. I don't, I don't know anybody my age who started training like I did when I was a teenager who doesn't have messed up shoulders, messed up knees, back, pain, pain, pain. I'm in pain all the time, every day. Some people are better off. Like my buddy Matt Pooley, he's like 48 now. His shoulder's still fine. He's still putting up like the one, I think he did like 180s last summer uh, for a couple reps, the dumbbells. Anyway, how not to become watery and bulking? Um, well, if you're natural, there's, there's no reason to be uh, retaining extra water. Uh, if you're using steroids, you'd obviously want to avoid, you know, the ones that really aromatize. You'd want to stay away from things like D-Ball and Anadrol. Even DECA can make you watery. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't worry about it. Why would you worry too much? I'd worry more about the body fat because a lot of times when you're fat and you're bulking, you can convince yourself it's water. It's just like when people are a week or two out from a show and they still have fat, but they're convinced it's just water. Once I drop my water, I'll be shredded. Nine times out of 10, when you think you're looking at uh, water on your body, it's fat. Most of us don't hold, unless, unless you have like a medical condition or you're on some medication that makes you retain a lot of water, you shouldn't be holding a, a great deal of water. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Spaniard Prince, I'm turning 40 in a few years, so you're still young, good for you, that's awesome. I'm thinking of taking 400 to 600 milligrams of test at that point. In your opinion, would that be safe to take for the rest of my life? I know TRT doses at 200 to 250 milligrams a month. Um, safe for you? I don't know. Safe for me? Let me get some wood here. I always knock on wood. I'm on 400, I've been on 400 a week. And then I blast. I put stuff on top of that like three times a year, four times a year for very brief periods. But I'm never on 200 milligrams a week of tests. It's always it's always 400, 200 like on a Monday and a Thursday. I'm very, very lucky. You know, I, I've said this before because I don't want you guys to use me as an example and say, well, he did it and he's fine, so I, I can do that and I'll be fine. You might not be fine. You might have severe problems. Um, just to give you an example, I had a, a sister. I always use this example because I think it – I think it, it means something. I had I have I had two sisters. One passed away. She was she was an opioid addict, heroin, and she was an addict like that for over twenty years. I think it was like more like twenty five years. Um, pronounced dead a couple times from overdoses. You know, most people's bodies would have given out long before she died. Just at forty nine, just before she would have turned fifty. Um, but you know, the amount of drugs she did. For the amount of time that she did, it's amazing. It's it's people don't believe me when I tell them, especially if they've known other addicts, because typically they die much younger than that uh, if they don't get clean. So I think something in my family were resilient. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I, I've been very fortunate because I do get blood work done every year. I have a cardiologist, so every year I get a, a ultrasound. They do an ultrasound. I went into the machine, the big machine where you get into the CAT scan of my heart. I do a calcium score. So I'm on top of that. And I've been very fortunate not to have any really adverse effects. My heart's still in great shape. Thank God. But would that be you? I don't know. I don't know. You know, you could try it and monitor, monitor your health, stay on top of all that. And of course, if you see anything going bad, going badly with your heart, uh, liver, kidneys, you'd probably want to take your dose down to 200, 250 a week. But, so I can't say you'd be okay. You might be just, you might be like me and be very lucky. Or, you know, I've, I've known so many people my age or younger that they were not lucky. Some of them had very severe problems. Some of them are dead. Uh, yeah, anyway. Freddie Erickson, 5'7". Five, 5'7 seven. Five, seven and a half, man, give me the half inch. I used to be over 5'8". <laughs> Strangely enough, there's, uh, so there's my family, there were seven siblings. Uh, two different dads. My five older brothers and sisters, which was three brothers and two sisters, were from one one dad. Um, and myself and my younger brother, Steve, 
three years younger than me, were from my dad, obviously, my mother's second marriage. He was six one and three quarters uh, at his height, at his height, at his prime, in his youth, because he's three years younger, so almost 52. He just turned 49. Anyway, he's down to like six foot and a half. He's lost some height too, but I don't know why he was so tall, because nobody else in our family was tall. My father's father was like five six my mother's father i think was only like five two or five three so for me to hit five eight i was pretty <laughs> my late father was five nine i don't know what the hell we're talking about height now anyway trt is below 200 definitely no spaniard prince thank you so much 1999 i don't know if you're in spain in España, pero mucha gracia, señor, para eso. trt is below 200 i've seen trt doses as low as 100 and I haven't seen too many over 250 milligrams a week, rarely. But 200, there's a ton of guys on 200, tons of guys. I think that's the most common dose. But, you know, a good doctor, they work with the patient and they make them get regular blood work. Um, you know, when I was getting legit TRT through a doctor, and I was fortunate enough to be a, a patient of Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler. That's M-O-R-G-E-N-T-A-L-E-R. If you want to Google him, he wrote a bunch of books on TRT. He was one of the pioneers of actual testosterone replacement therapy. He's a teacher at Harvard Medical School. Brilliant guy. But anyway, he knew I was a bodybuilder. He wasn't going to just give me steroid. He wasn't going to give me a ton of tests. He had me on TRT uh, pellets, and the pellets came out of my ass, so we switched to the, the androgel. And he would monitor. I had to do blood work. Uh, at one point, he had me doing it every two weeks, and they wanted to see what my levels were at because they he wanted to know if they needed if we needed to uh, increase my dose of test or lower it because he wanted to keep me in a certain range, a high normal range. He didn't want me getting above that. He didn't want me to get uh, below it. But, you know, a really a good doctor, they will monitor your blood and they, they find the dose that gets you in that ideal range and that's your dose. For some guys, maybe it's 100 milligrams. For other guys, it'll be 200, 250. I, I honestly don't know what it would take for me to be just at that range. I do stay higher than high normal. Um, high normal is something, you know, anywhere between like 600, 800, 900 at the very high end. I think that's considered high normal. And I think the last time I had mine checked, it was like a little over 2,000 um, on 400 milligrams a week. But like I said, I'm very lucky. Uh, I've never, I don't use AIs at all. And I never got gyno. The hair loss, well, like I said, there's five brothers in my family. I have the most hair out of all of them. Go figure. Um, and there is one younger than me. He's never used steroids, three years younger. Never seen a steroid in his life, Steve, I guarantee you. He's like, he's appalled that I use steroids because, you know, to, as far as he knows, it's like heroin. It lumps it in the same category. Oh, wow. There's another one. Spaniard Prince, you're on fire today. Thank you, man. There's another 20 bucks. Wow, you're awesome. Thank you, Spaniard Prince. So, where was I going with that? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Spaniard Prince, you could try that when you're older, but just keep, you know, keep a real good, uh, good eye on your blood work. I would get the heart scans done one, once a year, get an ultrasound done, get a calcium score done because you want to find out how much blockage, how much calcium is inside your blood vessels, your arteries, because once those start constricting and the blood pressure builds up and that's, that's how you end up having heart attacks eventually. Um, yeah, because the blood can't get through and it's, it's your heart stops. But let's see, TRT, oh, okay, let's see, hang on, wow, oh, wow, there's a lot, a lot of questions, I gotta get to all these before I go pick up Branch the Bubba as my pit bull, uh, Ronnie Coleman said he was 1% body fat, he was estimating, Ronnie doesn't know, Ronnie doesn't know, I mean, I love Ronnie, but it, I don't think he had any idea what his body fat was, I see you asking about the Arnold's, so I'm pulling out my Arnold sheet there for, in a minute, uh, that was Freddie McPews. I think he said negative. How can you have negative body fat? Come on, guys. <laughs> on Joe Rogan. Uh, Freddie Erickson, those scales test by water percent. So I don't know. Was I too dry or did I have too much water in me when I took that? I don't know. I actually got on another one about a month ago. I went to some very posh health club. To, there's a, the, that woman that I uh, coach. Uh, I was training legs, training her once every once, once every few weeks, I would put her through a leg workout just because she needs more legs and she needs that push. 
Anyway, I got another one of those and I was very, very lean. If you see me in the thumbnail, that was taken at the, the Muscle Vodka uh, pool party the day after the Tampa Pro back in, um, was that late July? Early August? When was that? Anyway, it was around that time I got on the scale and it said I was like 13% body fat. I'm like, dude, I have striations everywhere. I have veins. Come on, I'm 13% body fat. Blah. Nobody's real. How many cheat meals do you eat per week? Hmm. I don't structure them. And like I said, because I'm not getting ready for a show or anything, if if I'm someplace and they have like a bunch of free pizza, I'll eat the pizza. Like, uh, or if there's somewhere that, or if I want a cookie, like my wife gets those, uh, my cookie dealer cookies that Juan Morello and his wife Karen sell. At one point I was having like three of those a week. That was probably a bit much. That's a lot, but. You know, cheat meals, I would say as many as you can get away with while still staying as lean as you want to or getting closer to your goal. Like if you're dieting for a show and you're not getting lean very quickly, if you're not ahead of schedule, maybe you could get a refeed, but you don't need a cheat. Why, why, the cheat meals is just going to set you back. You know, people say, well, the leptin and the ghrelin and you got to, the cheat meal stimulates. You can do the same thing with a refeed, which is just a, a larger portions of your clean food. Uh, I don't really believe in cheat meals, but you know, in the in the oh, quote unquote off season, if you can get away with two or three a week, go ahead. But if you're eating them two or three cheat meals a week and you're getting fatter and fatter, then clearly you can't get away with it, and you need to scale it back. We're all different, man. Some some people can eat so much junk and still stay lean. Other people, man, I've worked with people like on their diets where, geez, these poor people, man, oh, they have to suffer to lose weight, suffer. They have to go like on almost no carbs, do so much cardio. Because just trying to eat like a bodybuilder clean food with, you know, good amount of carbs, the scale doesn't budge. They don't get any leaner. Uh, Freddie Erickson and Ryan played tennis at this club, which had a gold at the front. A player thought I was a bodybuilder off season six foot 215 compared to an average six foot 150 tennis player. Yeah, tennis players tend not to be the most massive human beings. Six foot 215 lean, that's, that's a good sized person, man. Yeah, you got some you got some beef on you. Ron is right, my friend. Juiced off season 220 and ripped 198. Look bigger at the show. Dude, yeah, it's I, I tell all I tell everyone, even if you don't have if you have no interest in competing, if you're like a perma bulker, you've never been lean, give yourself that gift just once. Get lean, just to see what your body looks like. You know, take some pictures. It doesn't have to be for a contest or a vacation or it doesn't have to be for anything, although those are tremendous motivating factors. But I tell everyone, give yourself that gift. Just once, get lean to see the, you'll see your muscles. You'll see the heads of your delts. You'll see the separation between the bicep and the brachialis and the triceps. You'll see, you know, separation between all the upper back muscles, some striations in your lats, your quad heads separated. You'll see all that. You'll actually see what your body looks like and you'll be like, wow, I look pretty damn good. Because I guarantee you, if you've never seen yourself lean before, any of you, that have a good amount of muscle mass, you'll be very pleasantly surprised at how good you look lean. You know, I'm not talking about how you look on stage compared to somebody else or how you look compared to guy pros or guys on Instagram, girls on Instagram with like 10 million followers. Just for yourself, you'll look so much better. Just give yourself that gift, guys. Uh, Riggs, Ron, what are you taking now? AAS speaking. I get this every time. All right, so right now, um, twice a week I do... 200 milligrams of test cypionates, 100 milligrams of deca durabilin. And right now, you guys are going to roast me, roast me. Right now, I'm also taking, uh, I was taking 25 milligrams of proviron a day. I stopped that because uh, three days a week now, I do one ml of trin acetate. I'm only doing that for a month. I love trin. You know, if, I, if it was really toxic, if I was having health issues from it, I don't even get trend cough. It doesn't keep me up. I don't have the trend sweats. I don't get too many of the bad effects from trend. Maybe the maybe a little bit of the trend rage, maybe at the times, but you know, maybe it's just regular rage. I don't know. So that's what I'm doing for. But like I said, it doesn't matter. Some of you could take even less than me and look so much better. Some of you could take way more than me and not even look as good. It's genetics are the bottom line, along with genetic response to gear. Some people have crazy awesome response to gear. Other people, eh, crappy response. Most people, somewhere in the middle, average. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Who wins the Arnold? 
Well, who wins the Arnold? We're talking open. Look at this list, guys. Lionel Bakey, don't see him winning. William Bonac, two-time winner. Very, very strong chance William Bonac is going to win this. Max Charles, doubt it. Sorry, Max. Sung Chul Lee, no. Muhammad El Amam, no. Steve Kukla, he might, he might win. Uh, he's damn good. He's going to have to beat Bonac. I don't believe he's ever beaten Bonac before. Hassan Mustafa, if Hassan, Hassan has so much muscle. If he just sharpened up a little bit more than what we've seen, yeah, I don't know. If Hassan showed up, you know, super shredded, dry, he could win. Sergio Oliva Jr., he could win the Arnold. He's freaking great. Justin Rodriguez, don't know. Ian Valier, Ian beat Kuklo in Texas, so, hmm. I don't know what's going to happen at the Arnold. Nick Walker, it's a long shot, but I know all of you under the age of 25, you believe Nick Walker will win the Arnold, and you know what? Maybe he will. He's got a ton of muscle, pretty damn good structure and shape. I don't know. It's it's going to be tough going up against guys with a little more muscle maturity, but we'll see what happens. I mean, oh my God, Akim Williams? Akim could win. He was sixth place at the Olympia. You know, Bonak beat him at the Olympia, but Akim's getting better and better. And Roly Winkler. Roly looked not very good at the Chicago Pro. He was downsized. Was it a week later in Texas? Two weeks later? A week or two later at the Texas... No, what am I saying? He didn't do Texas. He did... Uh, it was the same weekend. Alicante. It was uh, the Europa Pro. Sorry. He had put on a lot of that size back. So, Roly Winkler, the Roly that, that I saw many times in the past, he would win this show. The Roly that was third place at the 2018 Olympia, I don't think any of these guys right there could beat that Roly. If that Roly shows up, Woo! Lights out, game over. So, it's interesting. We'll see what happens. Uh, classic, if anyone of you guys can ask about that. Terrence Ruffin, very, very strong candidate. Alex Cambronero, also. They were, uh, Terrence was second at the Olympia last year. Alex was fourth. Brian Jones, who was fifth place at the Olympia last year. He is enormous right now. He could win. Austria from Austria, Fabian Mayer is very good. Peter Molnar from Hungary, very good. Courage Opara. Uh, Danny Union, yeah, it's, it's Logan Franklin. I mean, it's going to be a great, great Arnold in terms of the competitors for those two divisions. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let's see. Ron needs a pro card just to say you got one, yeah. I hate to put it that way just to say I got one. I mean, I would be very proud to be an IPB pro. So many of my friends are. And, you know, it, it's, it's not because I feel entitled to one. Nobody's entitled to a pro card. And, you know, I came, I, I started following sport in an era where almost nobody could turn pro. The late Menden, Matt Mendenhall passed away a couple weeks ago at 61. He was probably the best amateur to never turn pro. He is better than 90% of the people who are pros right now, open pros. I guarantee you. He never really got shredded. Conditioning was an issue for him. I never saw him, I never actually saw him compete personally. Did I see him once? I think I saw him once. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just, I, I want to do it just because it's, a, it's an achievement. It's an accomplishment. I've been doing this so long. Training for 38 years now. I competed for 24 years. I just really want it. So, right, uh, Brandon Cur Binks Cat. Brandon Curry is more ripped and balanced than Rami. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could argue that Brandon's not fully balanced because his legs don't quite still match his upper body. And you could say Rami's legs are too big for his upper body. So neither one of them has really perfect balance. You know, obviously Brandon was second last year. He's very close to getting his title back. Rami is in the U.S. now. He's training, staying with Dennis James, training with him every day. Dennis is posing him again. It could, he's working with Chad. Everything is... The same setup situation that Rami had last year when he looked his best. So I I I don't I don't know if anyone's taking Rami down this year. Pro Freddie says, Pro car would be great for your ego. Yeah, go for it. Would be that would if that was my thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's really just out of the uh, it's like that college degree that I never got, you know. It's like it's like going to college for four years, but like I did. And not graduating because you needed one more class. That's exactly my situation, but I don't care about my college degree. It wouldn't do anything for me at this stage of my life. The only person who really cared was my late mother because, you know, she wanted me to graduate. 
Uh, where am I? Brandon Curry is more ripped to balance. Yes, yes. Who's your Arnold pick? I pick Walker. Ooh, if you really push me, I'd have to go with Bonac. I really would. Just He's won it twice. He's been second at the Olympia. He's working with Rami's coach, ex-coach, I'm sorry, Abdullah Alotabi out of uh, Kuwait, out of the Oxen Gym. William's going to be very, very tough to beat. Not to say none of those other people, Nick, might beat him. We'll see. Okay. Game... Gamer Odis, I'm natural, but I have acne on my back. I did a blood test, but only bilirubin alkaline phosphorylase was higher than normal. Which food should I take or not to cure my acne issue? Uh, so Dr. T, who I do a show every every week, comes out every Tuesday morning, asks Dr. Testosterone. We've tackled this question many times. If you have severe acne, you know, you'd have to go the pharmaceutical route like Accutane. But he talks about, you know, astringents and things like that. I don't have a lot of experience in this area. You know, some people just get a lot more acne. You know, one thing you should always do is after you work out, try to shower and use like a, one of those brushes on your back. Try to shower as soon as possible. Try not to stay all sweaty and oily for hours and hours. That's not conducive to having clear skin. Um, you know, uh, I wish I had more to tell you, but that question has come up so many times on Dr. T, but he usually talks about pharmaceutical things. I don't think it's really that much related to your diet. Uh, Freddie Erickson, one extra cookie day, you'll gain five pounds in a year. Maybe more. I mean, those my cookie dealer cookies. Have you, have you seen them? They're like a pound. They're huge. I, I would, I, they don't have like calorie breakdowns on them, I don't, caloric breakdown, but I'm guessing each one of those cookies, I bet they're like 700, 800 calories each, maybe more. So if a, theoretically a pound of fat is 3,500 calories, I know that's been kind of debunked. But you, I think if you had a, a cookie, a cookie a day, and it was that cookie, maybe you're talking about little chips ahoy cookies or something. I don't know. But yeah, it all adds up. Calories in, calories out. Uh, really priest. Oh, you're not the really priest, are you? Off season bulk up, lol. I was supposed to worry. Well, if you, the Lee priest, if that really is you, yeah, Lee, I saw at like two, no, three. I think he hit 300 pounds one time. If that's you, Lee, it was, I saw you at the blue hair at World Gym Venice one time, Superman shirt, as always, and you were like 300 pounds. Yeah, yeah, Lee was the bulk. Lee showed that it doesn't matter what you look like in the off season, as long as you get in shape for contests. And he, so he went down to, I think when he finally won a pro, couple pro shows when he was working with Hani. I want to say he was only like 205 or something. It was much lighter than normal, but lean as he ever looked. And, you know, shape, symmetry was all perfect. Yeah, well, Lee was great in his time. Still looks damn good. Freddie, mine is fine. Back hips, knees. Since I never squatted, I did step-ups, leg curl, leg extension, leg press. I never thought having a bar press on your neck was good for your spine, plus no gear. Well, I used gear and I did a lot of heavy squats. I think I did the most damage to my back. Um, probably in my late 20s. The first few years I was on, I started steroids at 27, and my squat, I was obsessed with getting stronger and stronger on my squats, doing like one rep maxes, in addition to higher rep stuff. But at, the most I ever put on my back was seven, 745s and a 25. So that's 765. I did a couple of shitty half reps, but that weight was still pressing down, compressing my spine that whole time. And, you know, for many years, I would use much better form and do all the way down with between 405 and 495. For many, many years, I used that. I'm sure it didn't help. I, but I do know people, every time I, I talk about squats in my back, um, what's Larry's name? Larry out in California, he still competes every now and then as a master. He was he was abducted by a drug cartel. He's a gym owner. What the hell is Larry's name? Anyway, he still squats heavy, and he's older than me. He's a couple years older than me. So there are some people that are lucky. Like I said, like my shoulder's wrecked. But I have a friend, Matt. Like I said, he's like 48. He's been training heavy almost as long as me. And, man, he's still pushing up all kinds of crazy weight. Some people are just lucky with their joints. Or he's also a physical therapist, so he might have a doctor of physical therapy. He might have 
taken a lot more care to use proper form and warm up and things like that. Uh, Freddie Milos is on test for 30 years. Yeah, I think Milos, hasn't he said he uses 400 a week? I talk to him every time we're at the shows. I'll have to ask him, but I think Milos uses 400 a week and he's fine. He's very healthy. Milos looks great. He's like 57 now, I think. Yeah, I mean, he looks fantastic. Sorry to hear about your sister. Very sad. Yeah, I mean, addiction. People are very harsh on, on drug addicts. Um, they judge them very, very negatively, you know, morally weak, bad people, whatever. But, you know, unless you've really gone through it yourself, addiction, or you've been very, very close to someone who has a, a loved one, you know, it, it's it's very painful to watch because they, they can't stop. They literally can't stop the drugs. You know, my sister needed, she needed a new liver. And uh, my brother was a match. One of my older brothers was a match. They have the same parents. He was willing to give up half his liver for her because you can do that, I guess. You don't have to give your whole liver because you only got one liver. He was willing to do it, um, but she was getting methadone. Um, a, a van or something would come pick her up in the morning every day, take her to the meth to the clinic. They would give her her methadone, which is an op it's a synthetic opiate, similar effects to heroin, then drive her home. And I think she was still doing heroin on top of that. But the point is, is she needed to wean off, wean down to a certain very low dose of methadone to be eligible for that liver transplant. And she never did. She never got down to that level and then she passed away. But anyway, it's addiction sucks, guys. Uh, Freddie, when is your next doctor visit? See if you got shorter. <laughs> You're still six, six feet at 54. I hate when they do it because it seems like I get shorter every time. It's not like dramatic, but I remember because I was over 5'8 for a long time. I think my entire 20s, I was like 5'8 and a quarter, maybe 5'8 and a half, depending on who measured me, what doctor. And I think I held that until I was about 35. And then one day, one year, I was 5'8. I'm like, huh. I said, I know I'm over 5'8. And they said, nope, nope. And, you know, I tried to get up taller. Nope, still 5'8. Still and then, like a year, I was like a, a little over five eight and three quarter. I'm like, son of a bitch, I'm just getting shorter and shorter. And yeah, now it's like five seven and a half. I mean, I hope I don't get shorter, but I have uh, an inversion table. One of those things where you hang upside down. I don't know if it helps, but I do. I've been doing five minutes every night for for a year and a half or so. Doesn't seem to be helping, man. Luckily, like I said, luckily I married a beautiful wife because if I was on the dating market now, I'd be screwed. Uh, women just, they all want these freaking... <laughs> five-foot women will tell a five-foot 10 or five-foot 11 guy he's too short for her. <laughs> Silly girls, tricks for kids. Um, Binks Cat, if why ZYZZ danced around in techno music, he could have won classic physique. He had a hell of physique. You know what's funny is um, my son-in-law, Musa, He's Lebanese, but he grew up in Sydney, Australia, in the same neighborhood as ZYZZ, and he knew a, f a few people that knew him, and uh, yeah, that guy, young guy, what was he, only like 22 or 23 when he died? He was very young. He had a hell of a physique, hell of a build on that kid. He would have, I don't think he ever competed, but yeah, he could have done very well, you know, classic men's physique, whatever he wanted. He, I don't think he would have ever put on enough size for open bodybuilding. That wasn't what he wanted to do, but that that guy looked good. I don't, what was his real name? I don't even know what his real name was, but yeah, he had you know per, great genetics. It comes down to genetics. He had the, the wide clavicles, nice round shoulder caps, tiny waist, always had abs. He stayed super lean, and he did it purely to look good for social media, which was just starting. What was, what was it just like Facebook back then, MySpace, and uh, there wasn't even YouTube back then, was there? Uh, and to to go to these festivals, raves whatever and dance around with a shirt off and you know you're a young guy why not man why not uh lucian genetically lucian says genetically lean 12 to 15 percent slowish metabolism 17 19 percent this is recommendations he's giving his opinion on how how much body fat you should allow yourself to carry in the off season yeah jake lean 12 to 15 yeah yeah, he says 17 to 19%. If I have enough mass, if you have enough mass, you'll still look impressive, in my opinion. You'd look even more impressive if you're a little leaner, though. 
there, there aren't many people that look impressive all bulked up. They, they're big, but just fat isn't a good look for anybody. Um, it's just not. Everybody looks better, leaner. Everybody. I've never seen anybody that I know what they look like lean. I've never seen them in the off season all bulked up and go, wow, they look really good. I'd say they look huge, but man, they look bloated, bloated, puffy, uncomfortable. Yeah. This is held for review. Oh, someone doesn't like you, Freddie. But we're hiding it. We're not putting up this F off Freddie comment. Nick Stafford, what it was like working with Lee Priest? Uh, never boring. You know, Lee had a lot of, has, you know, he had, he's still alive. A lot of personality, never afraid to speak his mind. Um, made a lot of off-color remarks, a lot of politically incorrect uh, statements and remarks. But uh, I always liked talking to Lee. He was hilarious. He is hilarious. Great sense of humor. He goes too far sometimes because he doesn't care. He's not worried about offending people or being politically correct. And unfortunately, in this day and age, in this society, you get canceled if you do that, if you offend a lot of people and you say things that are deemed, you know, insensitive to uh, people of other races or, uh, you know, handicapped people or whatever. But, man, I always, I always enjoyed working with Lee. We did a column for MD for a couple of years. It was probably the most fun I had with columns because, like I said, he was always off the, off the wall with sex stories, drug stories, just, you know, a lot of hilarity. But, you know, I even I got in trouble a couple times for because of his column. Um, because the powers of B knew that I wrote it, even though it was his words, it wasn't me making stuff up, but they were so offended sometimes by things he said, and I would get the, <laughs> the shit end of that. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I always enjoyed working with Lee. How would a peak 2010 to 2015 Rich Piana score in the Olympia? Rich did not have a great bodybuilding physique for a stage. No, he did not. I'm sorry to break it to you. Just like I saw last year after Rami won the Olympia, I saw, I don't know where it was. It was on Facebook or Instagram or somebody who was a Dave Palumbo fan, and that's fine. Uh, they put up a couple pictures of Dave next to Rami, you know, the side-by-side -side comparisons. And they were saying Dave back then could have beat Big Rami, the 2020 version of Big Rami that won the Mr. Olympia. Anybody who knows how these judge, how these contests are judged and what the judges are looking for, you would immediately see a physique like Dave's or even Rich's and go, nope, nope. Rich didn't have the legs to match his upper body. He had so much, oh, what, what's the weight? What's the year range you were saying? Then? 210 to 2015. Even then he had a bunch of shit in his shoulders and arms. He would have not, he would have got marked down for that. Rich did not have a great stage physique. He had a great physique for walking around at like expos, Whatever. It was very impressive because he was huge. A lot of it was oil, but he had a lot of muscle mass, too. He was a big dude. He had all the tattoos. Cool guy. Great personality. Competition. He wouldn't have done that well at all. In fact, he didn't do that well at all when he competed. He won. He did win the Mr. California. Um, he looked good back then. He wasn't great. He wasn't going to be, you know, by today's standards, he probably could have turned pro with that physique before he started putting all the crap in his arms and his shoulders. But, yeah, it's it's it's... Two different things to look really good walking around like in shorts and a tank top and to look good on stage in little trunks from every angle where that you can't hide anything. So, yeah, that's what I think. Spaniard Prince, another 20. Good Lord. You're the best, man. Spaniard Prince. Wow, dude, thank you. Freddie Erickson, 2,000 Tesla. That's almost three times high normal. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I know. I'm well aware. I, I'm not advocating. I'm not saying you guys should do that too. And it's, you'll be fine. Maybe you won't be fine. Luckily, through the grace of God, I'm fine. And, you know, I'm getting more blood work done um, in December. If I see anything that's, you know, not good, I'm going to, I'll take my levels down. You know, I'm actually very, very strongly considering if I do that show next year and reach my goal of turning pro, just go on real TRT. 250 milligrams a week for the rest of my life. No other steroids, nothing else, but we're not there yet. It's still a ways away. Freddie says, my Tesla was 435. I feel fine. If I was 2000, would I be stronger? Not necessarily. No. If you feel fine now, why mess with it? Like, you know that phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you're, if you're looking